Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we have looked at munitions and clothing production, the railways and shipbuilding. Finally, we hear from Dr Martin Wilcox about shipping and overseas trade. My name is Dr Martin Wilcox. I'm a lecturer in history at the University of Hull and a member of the Maritime Historical Studies Centre at that institution. I'm looking at merchant shipping and overseas trade during the First World War. At the outset of the First World War, the British shipping industry is in a position of unparalleled dominance. It accounts for about 19 million tonnes of shipping, and that is about half the world fleet. It carries two-thirds of Britain's trade with foreign countries. It carries about 94% of trade with the empire. The British fleet is the most modern and the most efficient in the world. In the years immediately before World War I, its dominance does start to slip slightly, not in absolute terms, but because of the rise of competitors, and particularly Germany, whose shipping companies are very well managed, very modern, very efficient, and quite aggressive in their business strategies. And they do start to encroach on the position of British shipping, particularly in the liner trades. There's never any doubt that shipping is going to be a major target of attack in World War I. Britain is dependent on overseas trade. During the 19th century, most developed economies, with Britain at the forefront, import the raw materials they need, and they import the foodstuffs they need. They become decreasingly able to provide for their own populations, and they export finished products. Britain also exports a huge amount of coal, which is a great advantage for the British shipping industry. Coal subsidises the outward bound voyage for British ships, and that means that they can charge a lower freight on the return voyage. So coal is a big part of the British shipping industry. One thing that is obvious as war starts to loom is that Britain is heavily dependent on imports of food. In 1914, Britain imports all of its sugar, four-fifths of its grain, two-thirds of its butter, and 40% of its meat. Fully two-thirds of the British calorific intake comes from overseas. There is no doubt at all that enemies in wartime are going to try to interdict this and that merchant shipping is going to be in the front line in a way that no other key civilian industry is. In World War I, countries seek to deny one another imports. Britain does this by sealing off the Straits of Dover and the waters north of the United Kingdom and mounting a so-called distant blockade of Germany. Germany tries to cut British maritime supply lines using three key weapons. The first is the surface cruiser. These are mainly a feature of the early years of the war. They don't actually account for a huge amount in terms of British shipping tonnage taken and sunk. The most successful of those cruisers only sinks or captures 73,000 tonnes of shipping, which is tiny in the grand scheme of things. What they do do is force up insurance rates. The German aim right at the beginning of the war is to force up insurance rates so British shippers withdraw so that neutral shippers will not trade with Britain either. The British state moves very, very quickly to remedy this by setting up a state insurance scheme, and the disruption that's caused at the outset of war, mainly by the threat of surface raiders, is very quickly contained. The surface raiders, most of them, have either been captured, sunk, or rendered impotent by lack of coal, lack of bases to operate from by the middle of 1915. From then on, the two main weapons in the war on merchant shipping are the mine in home waters and the submarine. The German submarines at the beginning of the war operate on the traditional rules of war which were designed for surface warships, whereby they are supposed to order the ship to stop to allow the crew time to evacuate before they either take or sink the ship. For much of World War I, German submarines do actually follow this, but there are three periods of so-called unrestricted submarine warfare. The first of these is in 1915. Losses mount up very quickly, but that submarine campaign is called off in the wake of perhaps the most famous maritime incident of World War I, or certainly merchant shipping-related incident, the sinking of the Lusitania in May 1915, with the loss of around 1,200 lives, only a few miles off the coast of Ireland. The big issue with the Lusitania is that a great many American lives are lost. Now, it isn't true to say that the Lusitania incident brings the Americans into the war. That does not happen for another two years. But it does threaten a major diplomatic rupture with the Americans that the Germans are not prepared to risk in 1915. So the campaign is called off. The second period is quite brief. The third one in 1917, the losses shoot up to about 545,000 tonnes of shipping in the worst month. Losses early in the war have been running in the tens of thousands. Now they're in the hundreds of thousands. This threatens the entire Allied war effort. There is a real possibility that they will bring the Allies to defeat in 1917. 
One of the major sea routes throughout the First World War is the North Atlantic. The North Atlantic supply line is crucial because Britain obtained so much in the way of foodstuffs, oil and other essentials from North America. And then in 1917, America enters the war and American troops have to be shipped across the Atlantic right at the time of the third unrestricted submarine campaign. So defeating that campaign is central. The way that is done is via convoy. The Admiralty had set its face against convoy at the outset of the war. This is despite the fact that in every war during the 18th century, convoy was used with great success. They argued that convoys were impractical, that they would cause too much disruption to the standard patterns of trade, and that patrol was sufficient to keep the sea lanes clear and to keep losses to an acceptable level. It's not until 1917, in the face of really disastrous losses, that the Admiralty is forced to reconsider, forced particularly by pressure from the politicians. At that point, they implement convoy, and to quote a key official in the Ministry of Shipping during World War I, that is amazingly successful. Losses immediately plummet back to an acceptable level, still higher than prior to the unrestricted campaign, but back to a level that can be contained. Then the American emergency shipbuilding programme comes on stream, and this also helps to replace much of the tonnage that is being lost. The British shipping industry, alone among major British industries, is constantly and directly exposed to enemy action. During the First World War, around 14,500 merchant seamen lose their lives, and more than 3,000 are interned or taken prisoner. This is not fully appreciated at the time. There are several documented incidents of seamen being given white feathers, the suggestion that they were cowards because they were not in uniform. The proportion of the British merchant fleet is taken up directly to service the war effort. Any British ship is legally liable to requisition from the outset. There are two main areas of activity. Firstly, troop ships and hospital ships. The demand for troop ships can be very large indeed, although it's uneven. Obviously, the demand is much larger when there are major deployments. Early in the war, the deployment of the British Expeditionary Force requires 250 ships. And in the first months of the war, total requisitioning rises rapidly to the point where 4 million tonnes of shipping is under requisition. That's of a pre-war fleet of around 19 million tonnes. A lot of the tonnage taken up for troop ships and hospital ships is the largest and the fastest of the ocean liners, including many of the famous transatlantic liners, the White Star Line, and its three enormous ships launched in the years before World War I. Of course, the most famous of these is the Titanic, which is lost in 1912. Its two sister ships both see service in World War I. Olympic is a troop ship from early 1915 and survives the war. Britannic is immediately on launch, converted into a hospital ship, in which capacity it's sunk by a mine in the Aegean in 1916, thankfully with small loss of life. The other area where merchant ships are taken up directly to service the war effort is armed merchant cruisers. Some ships, particularly fast ocean liners, not usually the largest, they're just too large a target, too heavy on fuel, too difficult to manoeuvre. But second string liners, particularly the faster ones, are often taken up, fitted with guns and fitted out as auxiliary warships. A famous example would be the Cunard liner Carmania, which fights the German armed merchant cruiser Cap Trafalgar in 1914 and sinks it, albeit at the cost of extremely heavy damage to itself. One armed liner, the Otranto, is actually in the line of battle at the Battle of Coronel in November 1914 when the British flagship and another cruiser are lost with all hands. Otranto actually survives the battle. Beyond the state's direct requirements, the government has to maintain supplies of food and other essential commodities. From an early stage of the war, all refrigerated cargo space is requisitioned for imports of meat, particularly. By early 1915, sugar is also moving in requisitioned ships. Ships or hold space within them is requisitioned by government at standard rates, the so-called Blue Book rates. These are agreed by a committee of ship owners shortly before the war. Initially, they're actually above standard market rates, but one effect of the war, predictably, is to cause freight rates in the open market to rocket. And the Blue Book rates do then leave owners whose ships have been requisitioned or space within those ships has been requisitioned at a disadvantage relative to ships that are still operating in the open market. As their costs also rise, by 1917 some ship owners believe that they're running at a loss. In response to that, the Blue Book rates are revised in 1918. Early in the war, though, requisitioned ships, both for military needs and for carrying essential supplies, represent only a relatively small proportion of the total tonnage available. The bulk of the British shipping industry is free to trade at market rates. As these rise rapidly, some parts of the industry make quite spectacular profits. 
this begins to become an increasing problem for government because thanks to war losses, the demands of the military, and the fact that ships have to be rerouted, a lot of commodities cannot come from their usual sources. They have to be sourced from much further afield. Sugar would be an example. They have to start sourcing it from Asia. Ships are making much longer voyages than they were, which means it's taking much longer to do a single journey. Also, the ports become very seriously congested. Ships are having to wait days, weeks to discharge, which again serves to reduce the total capacity available. What this does during 1916 and 1917 is to create a very serious tonnage shortage. As with many other wartime industries, governments react to the situation rather than planning ahead. They try and cut out non-essential work. They set up in late 1915 a licensing system initially for ships trading outside the British Empire, but later to all ships. Effectively, licences are only issued to ships that are doing essential war work. What this does is lay the ground for an extension of control to the whole merchant fleet. In December 1916, the new government, David Lloyd George's government, establishes a Ministry of Shipping. This is headed by the Scottish ship owner, Joseph Maclay, and then in early 1917, it undertakes general requisitioning at Blue Book rates. So all tonnage is requisitioned at those rates. Where it's not required, ship owners are still free to use part of their ship, or even all of it, at market rates. But this is only a very small minority. Really, after 1916, no ship operates completely outside government control. People don't like this. The shipping industry historically has trumpeted the virtues of free trade, the free market. A committee appointed by the Board of Trade to consider the position of the industry after the war and how it should be reconstructed talked about control as being alien to the British genius and argued that it would paralyse individual effort. But they certainly did not argue that the war could have been prosecuted without it. What they do argue is that it should be dismantled quickly at the end of the war to allow British shipping to regain its former dominance. Unfortunately, the British shipping industry is never able to regain its former dominance. We can divide the effects of the war into the short term and the long term. In the short term, some companies do extremely well because of the rise in freight rates during the war for ships that are not under requisition. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, later Prime Minister, Andrew Bona Law, causes some upset in July 1917 in the House of Commons with the value of his shipping investments. He says that shares that in a normal year would have earned him £400 in 1915 had earned him £2,600. The government does clamp down on this by extending the Finance Act of 1915, under which there is a duty on excess profits. This is extended to the shipping industry. Because earnings are very high, and because ships are in short supply, the value even of old ships shoots up. Sailing ships are actually still quite an important part of the world fleet in 1914, although not so much the British fleet. Elderly sailing ships, which might in normal times have gone for scrap, are actually put back to work during World War I. What happens within the British fleet is that the high earnings and the value of ships drives a wave of mergers and acquisitions across the industry. P&O, for example, goes on an acquisition spree and takes over a string of companies, both in the liner sector but also, and this is relatively new, it gets in on tramp shipping as well. By tramp shipping, I mean ships that don't sail to a timetable. They go wherever the cargoes are to be found. Historically, the liner sector and the tramp sector had tended to hold themselves quite apart from one another. P&O during the war gets into both. The other side of the coin is the disappearance of some well-respected firms who decide to sell up and leave the industry. For example, the Wilson line of Hull. Before the war, this is the largest privately owned shipping company in the world. All the shares are held by the Wilson family. It has more than 100 vessels in 1914. Although its main routes are concentrated in the North Sea and in Europe, you can catch a steamer from Hull to Australia, from Hull to India. In 1916, after heavy war losses, but also the value of their surviving fleet being so much higher, the family sells out to John Reeves Elliman, and the company becomes Elliman's Wilson line. So with a wave of acquisitions across the industry, and with the disappearance of some firms who decide to sell up amid wartime conditions, the shipping industry, particularly the liner sector, becomes more concentrated. During the 1920s and 1930s, in a way that it hasn't been before World War I, it's in the hands of a few very large firms. Many of them operate several companies in parallel, P&O, for example, or the Royal Mail Group. Starting as early as the 1830s, the British government develops the liner shipping sector quite strategically and with defence considerations through the award of mail contracts. They're effectively a subsidy, a slightly hidden subsidy, to carry government communications, government officials. Some of the contracts early in the 19th century specify that the ships must be made available as warships in wartime. The Cunard lines, Lusitania, which is sunk in May 1915, Mauritania and Aquitania. 
All of these ships have the mail contract, so they receive a subsidy for the North Atlantic run, but part of the contract is that they must be made available to government in wartime. Lusitania remains in general trade until she's sunk by U-20 in May 1915. Aquitania and Mauritania, however, both serve as troop ships. The idea initially was that they would serve as armed merchant cruisers, a merchant ship that has been taken up for use as an auxiliary warship. Mauritania had gun mountings worked into her decks. She was designed for quick conversion into a warship. However, they were too large a target, they used too much coal, and they were too difficult to manoeuvre. They found that they were much better as troop ships. They perform an immensely valuable service because they can carry a huge number of troops, and they are by far the fastest merchant ships in the world. They can outrun any submarine. This is one reason why Lusitania, they don't worry too much about her until the worst happens. One other effect of the war, you get speculators moving into the shipping industry. The director of ship requisitioning argued that that, and I quote, increased the speculative at the expense of the stable elements of the industry. This lays the groundwork for a major slump, which happens in 1920. The year or so after World War I is extremely good for the shipping industry. There's still a shortage of shipping. Shipping is being decontrolled, although not immediately. There's a huge amount of outstanding war work still to be done. Repatriation of troops, prisoners of war, plus the tonnage shortage. The world fleet is still considerably less than it had been at the outset of the war because the ports are still congested. In 1920, that comes to an end and the shipping industry experiences a disastrous slump. Now, this drives another wave of mergers and acquisitions, and this, along with the wartime wave, is what leaves much of the industry in the hands of a few giant combines. The very high wartime profits earned by some firms are salted away in reserve accounts, and they're used to cover operational losses during the 1920s, and then again during the depressed years of the 1930s. This deters ship owners and shipping companies from confronting quite fundamental questions about the British shipping industry and what it should look like in future. Coastal shipping is visibly damaged by the war. Before World War I, that moves 40% of tonne miles, tonnage of goods multiplied by the miles that they're carried. It's carrying the bulky, low-value goods over long distances to a far greater extent than the railways are. During the war, much of that business is diverted to the railways and it never returns. The other effect of World War I is that it encourages competitors. It gives a huge fillet, particularly to the Japanese shipping industry and to Scandinavian shipping industries, particularly Norwegian. The Japanese shipping industry has been expanding quite fast from the 1880s, but its penetration of the Pacific before World War I is somewhat limited by the presence of British shipping firms, which are engaged in a multiplicity of trade routes in and around the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. A lot of British shipping is withdrawn from those routes during the war. Japanese shipping moves into the gap, and British ship owners are never really able to regain their former dominance of those trades. They do get back into them to a limited extent between the wars, but they've lost a part of their business permanently. In 1914, London is the great entrepot port of the world, also Liverpool to a certain extent. Goods come in from all over the world, are then broken down into smaller consignments and re-exported. The proportion of that trade is lost permanently. For example, before World War I, Australia does not export wool directly to America. It sends it to London, and it is then shipped on to America. During the war, that is too dangerous and too expensive, presumably, and it goes direct. That trade is never regained. World War I serves to edge the British shipping industry out of some of its key markets. At the end of World War I, King George V coins the term merchant navy to commemorate the contribution of the British merchant shipping industry to the war effort. There's no doubt at all that its contribution was absolutely crucial, but British shipping has been too damaged by the war. That is not obvious in 1918. The shipping industry is preoccupied with trying to get back to normality, or normalcy, to use the rather ugly word that ship owners themselves used at the time. But that normalcy will never return. For the British shipping industry, the effects of the First World War were ultimately disastrous. That was Dr. Martin Wilcox on shipping and overseas trade. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. Do join us for our next set of podcasts when we look at the impact of the war on society and family life.